Okay, all right, we are live. Thank you everybody for joining us for another one of our SEIU 503 monthly updates here on Facebook Live. Uh, we've got a great group today. Uh, my name is Ben Morris. I'm SEIU 503's communications director. And we are joined today by Rebecca Sandoval, who's a home care worker and member of the bargaining team. Uh, Yvonne Rivero, who's a member of the Latinx caucus. Mike Powers and Melissa Unger, who are our president and executive director. Uh, and we're going to be talking about our home care contracts, Latinx Heritage Month, updates on vaccine mandates, and the kickoff of our higher ed bargaining work. So a lot of very exciting stuff to talk about. <clears throat> All right, so without further ado, uh, I wanna bring in Rebecca Sandoval, who's joining us today to talk about contract negotiations for home care and personal support workers. Uh, Rebecca Sandoval is SEIU 503's vice president and chair of the home care bargaining team. Uh, Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my extreme pleasure, Ben. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of thank course. And um, so we are in the final stages of negotiating a new contract for home care and some personal, personal support workers. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what folks could be expecting this year? Well, you know what? We are very hopeful and excited. We're just about done. We thought we were done last Tuesday. We thought we were done yesterday. We're really sure we're going to be done this coming Tuesday. So we should have some great big news for everybody very shortly. But, you know, already this contract is easily the best contract we've ever had. We got a huge amount of input from our members in bargaining surveys in the beginning. And we've been focused on priorities like wages and hazard pay and safety and, and more. Um, we are expecting an economic package that demonstrates a real investment in care work. Um, it's a game changer. This will include hazard pay, huge raises, holiday pay. Yes, for the first time ever, we're going to get holiday pay. And some other compensations like raising the mileage to the federal level, to the federal rate and parking reimbursement for people that have to pay to park at their consumers' homes. That's a, a big deal for people who live in the Portland metro area, especially, or anybody who lives in a metro area where they're being forced to pay to, to park just to work for their consumer. It's huge. We're also working to improve system. For example, something that we've already won that even though the contract's not final yet is that they have agreed to do daily payroll processing. And, and this is huge because before, even when it was through no fault of your own, you were gonna have to probably wait until the next pay period. And certainly if it was your own fault, you had to wait till the next payday to get paid. Well, they're gonna be processing it right away now. And this means that all of these pay issues are gonna be resolved quickly instead of having to wait. We are also fighting really hard for um, safety and health, um, I guess, protections for our workforce. Um, kind of being aware of something before we even go into a consumer's home. We're working really hard to bring these protections to our workforce. Thanks, Rebecca. I know these uh, issues mean a lot to you, and it's not just about dollars and cents, although, you know, getting a raise and getting hazard pay and things like that absolutely, of course, matter a lot. But uh, can you describe to us a little bit more about just how you're feeling as we reach the end of this campaign? You know, honestly, this is actually the seventh contract that I've gotten to negotiate as chair. And each one has built and gotten better each time. And I feel like this one, I mean, I know we're going to continue to go and go and do great, great things in the future. But this contract has really been, I believe, almost a, pers a perspective shift. I feel like we have gotten um, some real respect. I mean, we demanded it. We fought for it. We begged for, I mean, begged for it. We said we did, you know, we need to be respected. And I feel like the state really has tried to respect us in this contract in a meaningful way. And I'm sure a lot of that has to do with the fact that our workers, that we showed up and we took care of our consumers, even, in, even during the pandemic, I mean, at risk to our own health, we were still there because we knew our consumers needed us. And we saved lives because we were there for our consumers. So I think that this, this campaign has really been all about respect for the work that we do and recognizing that home care is essential. It's amazing the national statistics on how much people support our program. 81% of voters, I mean, that's amazing that a, there, nobody agrees on 81% of anything, but they do on how important home care is. 
that's huge for us to get that kind of national and statewide recognition. Um, this contract, when it's final, will also be an important investment in services, not just the services that we provide, but um, I guess in services in general for our state. It's, it's just incredibly exciting. It really is. I'm beside myself. <laughs> we can tell. That's, that's really awesome. Um, so what's next for the bargaining team? What are, the, uh, what are the final steps we need to take here to get over the finish line? Well, we do have one more session left, like I said, on Tuesday with DHS. We're hoping to reach a tentative agreement that by then. We actually are there on almost everything. There's just a few issues that are still outstanding, um, but we're pretty sure we're gonna be able to, we passed them a, a proposal. We're pretty sure we're gonna be able to get there on Tuesday. Um, and if that happens, we'll share the news with everybody over email and social media. Um, and, that, and then we will start the ratification process which if you don't know, that's when we take the contract that we have tentative, tentatively agreed to and share it with our, um, our members. And we actually offer membership applications for people who are just home care workers who haven't joined yet because maybe they didn't know about how to join. We're gonna send all these out and we're gonna let everybody look at this great contract that we've got and vote on it. And once we've done that, it'll be ratified, it'll be, um, that's the process that we go through to get this contract, I guess, signed and, and done. And that's what we'll be working on. So there'll be a lot of info coming your way over the next couple of weeks. So please keep an eye out. And if you're not already a member, this is the time to join. So you can vote on this great contract. I mean, it's so exciting what we're getting. So thank you guys. Thank you so much for being here today. Appreciate you being here. Yeah, thank you so much, Rebecca. I really appreciate you jumping on uh, to give us that important update. So uh, I'm just gonna move right along here because we wanna be able to get to everybody as quick as possible. Um, and next I wanna welcome in Yvonne Rivero, who is an active member of our union's Latinx caucus. Yvonne, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, it's uh, really a pleasure and privilege to be here with you in this, uh, you know, in this messages to our memberships and to the public in general. Uh, I want to, first of all, I want to thank uh, Melissa Unger and uh, President Mike Powers on the recent uh, public message and recognition of Hispanic, uh, Hispanic Heritage Month, uh, which is a little long to carry here, but I'd like to direct you to uh, the link uh, where you can find um, uh, the statement, the public statement in support of Heritage, uh, Hispanic Heritage Month uh, 2021, uh, which, uh, as I said, you can see on the 503 website. Um, we often, you know, unfortunately, you know, we often uh, work a lot, you know, but it's also the, the time when kids are coming back to school. They're so, you know, especially this year, and so we really feel important that uh, there's this recognition. And uh, I, um, I like to also share um, some, of the, some of the work that we've been doing, you know, in some of the people who are and have historically been with us in the Latinx Cup. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Appreciate it. Um, so, you know, as you mentioned, right now it is Latinx or Hispanic Heritage Month, and it's a perfect time for us to talk about the kind of work you do in the caucus. So I was hoping you could just tell us a little bit more about what the caucus does and why it's so important to you that we have one. Thank you. Uh, the Latinx Caucus is a group of members who share similar interests, struggles, history, and who are passionate about making change in our communities. We have established a set of priorities that guide us, which includes education, healthcare, immigration, and economic development for members and our community. Uh, we have some events uh, where we have spent uh, an enormous amount of time, uh, you know, especially, you know, this last year uh, came as a surprise to all of us that, you know, promptly after, I don't know, like the end of February, uh, you know, most of our events went virtual. And, uh, but we do have a story. And first of all, I want to recognize the past uh, celebrations and work of the Latinx caucus. And I have to say that 
our Hispanic, uh, Hispanic heritage barbecues are, are famous <laughs> for the incredible barbecues that they used to give, the music, the gathering, the community making. Uh, this used to be held, you know, uh, at times, you know, both in Portland and Salem. But the Salem uh, that Carmen, our former, uh, our former chair, used to make, they're, they're the best. So kudos to all of the people who participated there. Uh, they used to be held at the Salem uh, headquarters. Uh, last year, uh, we celebrated the 2020 Day of the Dead in collaboration with the Indigenous Caucus. It's uh, an event that I believe is on record uh, with our video uh, library. Uh, we divided, I, I'm dividing this when the pre-pandemic and, you know, and then the post-pandemic. Uh, post-pandemic, we are uh, uh, developing, giving a lot of awareness, uh, um, monthly awareness about health issues, updates, vaccines, uh, food access and food justice, especially at the beginning of the pandemic when people were you know, uh, in sh uh, shelter and many, many people lost their jobs uh, or even access to transportation. Uh, we are giving monthly uh, training updates and opportunities, uh, updates about benefits, and lately on current negotiations and electronic uh, time capture system and EVV. Uh, one important shift that we uh, went through is that on developing appropriate uh, uh, cultural engagement is that due to the type of responses obtained after the caucus, uh, the 2020 caucus MLDP, uh, in, you know, the caucus, the Latinx caucus conducted, um, you know, some um, information gathering uh, during March and April of 2020. And it was evidence that there was a lot of need for information, resources, and connection, especially in Spanish. So therefore we realized the divide, uh, you know, the linguistic device and the need for information, uh, specifically food justice and others and, and connection. And so we started, um, you know, providing this, uh, making the focus of these meetings in Spanish with, and, and later we obtained the capacity to do these meetings uh, both in English with simultaneous professional interpretation into English. So we have language access on the spot for a, a different and large community of both state workers and computer workers, PSWs, people who don't have digital access and they're accessing through their cell phones. So it's a lot of logistics, a lot of work, you know, but it's an incredibly rewarding job. Yeah, thank you so much, Avon. I, I know you and other members of the caucus have done a ton to push us to become a more accessible union. And I think we made huge strides over the last couple of years when it comes to language accessibility. And you and your fellow caucus members have a lot to do with that. So, so thank you. Um, one last question, if you could just, um, Tell us a little bit about what motivates you to do this work. I'm really curious to hear uh, why you are so active in this way. Thank you, Ben. Uh, there's uh, there's there's two main reasons, you know, and one of the big reasons that I have uh, always in my mind is uh, the great need that we have uh, for. Uh, participation, you know, uh, I am really convinced of the work that the union is doing in, you know, it, with its five year strategic plan uh, to become an anti racist union. And so, race, uh, racial justice work is union's work. And there's so much that we can do within our union to improve the lives of members of the Latinx community by addressing uh, racism language barriers, other issues that marginalize our people. And only by doing this work, we can fully represent all of our members. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I know you wanted to take a minute to recognize some of the other members of the caucus who couldn't be here today. Uh, please go ahead. I'm really curious to know who the uh, key folks are who are doing this work. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm going to say uh, a big thank you uh, 
uh, first to Carmen Morales Amberster. She is the Latino and Latinx, uh, Latinx caucus founder. Carmen is a recognized state worker for many years, over 25 years. She joined the union in 2006, becoming a union steward, then assistant board director in 2008, elected as a board member in 2011 for two terms. And then she's the former founder of the Latinx caucus, became a chair. Uh, she is currently the co-chair of the Civil and Human Rights Committee. I am coming on her huge uh, steps. Uh, just have, uh, you know, I, I was elected uh, recently in June, uh, along with uh, in sharing the, the chair position with Martin Ramirez, uh, who is another one of the Latinos uh, caucus uh, founders. I'd like to send appreciation to all the work that Belinda Ochoa, Hismelia Cartier, uh, have done in the executive committee uh, throughout its history. Uh, kudos to Guillermo Romero, who has also been in the union. He's a Chicano leader and Latino leader for many, many years, uh, even from the 70s in the state of Oregon. Uh, salute to Fina Riggs in Bend, uh, also working in the community on, uh, at the state level. Maria Hernandez uh, from Washington County, who has organized uh, healthcare workers in an incredible way. Jan Montes in Salem and Whitburn. Uh, and our most recent recruit, Noemi Osorio Sarmiento, who is joining the you know, uh, leadership at the Home Care Commission as well, uh, despite uh, speaking primarily Spanish. I want to say also that we couldn't do this work were it not for people who work at SEIU. And so I like to say uh, a big thank you to some Peruvians. Uh, Peru is the organization within SEIU. First to Gabe Gabriel Olguin, who's been uh, so supportive throughout uh, these two years of working with the Latinx Caucus, to Fernando Cortez, uh, Cortez Chirino, PhD, to Lucy Whitesell, Daniel Lopez, our coordinator with the MLDP Latinx and other Caucuses, Nicta Verdugo in Salem, Maria Chavez Torres in IT. Special mention to our sibling and longstanding memberships, uh, uh, Paula Pena in the Marion County area, Angie Seja, Nanette D, the volunteer Carter Jaffe, and Elizabeth uh, who joined. I'm sorry, I am missing right now her last name. Thank you so much. Uh, before I leave, I, I like to invite our SEIU members to come and celebrate our Hispanic Heritage Month celebration, October 9th, because the month goes from October the 15th, uh, so, sorry, September the 15th to October the 15th. And so it's gonna be October the 9th, 11 a.m. And you need to register. And uh, I sent you the links uh, for people to join. And I know that they will come with the, with the Facebook thing, right? Thank you, Melissa. Thank they you, will. Ben. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Yvonne. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Um, and it certainly takes a village to do all of the work that you're talking about. So appreciate you taking the time to recognize everybody. We will drop those links um, to the event in the uh, comments on the page. So folks should go ahead and register. All right, next we're gonna bring in Mike Powers. Mike. Um, Switching gears a little bit here, I know there has been a tremendous amount of news coming really quickly about vaccine mandates impacting lots of different members of our organization. What's the, what's the latest? Hey Ben, uh, thanks for having me. Love to talk about the vaccine mandates a little bit. Uh, we've got a couple of different things to talk about regarding that and state bargaining. Uh, for the public sector, we recently signed a letter of agreement uh, with the state covering how the vaccine mandate for state employees will be implemented. In our agreement, we made sure that workers uh, would have the paid leave, flexibility, and education they need to come into compliance with the mandate. We also made sure there would be a clear process that folks can understand for asking for an exemption. 
We also negotiated a grace period for people who are in the process of taking the vaccine or who are, uh, have a pending uh, exemption request. We're going to still need to have taken their first shot or applied for an exemption by the original deadline of October 18. But this additional flexibility will make sure people are able to come into compliance with the new policy. Now for our healthcare workers, on September 9th, President Biden issued a vaccine mandate for healthcare workers. We are expecting the federal centers for Medicaid and Medicare services to issue a rule for the specifics on who this covers and the details on how it will work. What happens, when that happens, we will be following up with nursing home workers, home care workers, and other health care workers in our union. Now regarding large employers, President Biden also issued a vaccine and testing policy for any employer with more than 100 employees. This likely includes many local governments and private nonprofit organizations in our union. Similar to the healthcare worker mandate, we are waiting on regulators at OSHA to issue a rule with more specific information. And when that happens, uh, again, we'll continue, we'll communicate with impacted workers on the details. Thanks, Mike. I know this is an issue that many members of our union feel very deeply about. And you recently published a blog post on our website that I will also link in the comments on the Facebook post. Uh, but the blog post is about how important it is for us to have a voice in these decisions. Could you share with us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. And, and thanks for uh, posting a, a link to that, Ben. I appreciate that. And uh, in that uh, post, I compared the way companies like Google and Walmart issued vaccine mandates. They did it unilaterally without even talking to their workers. But with most, but with most Oregon uh, mandates, workers get to have a say in how these policies are implemented. And when, and that's the union difference. So Oregon workers who are in a union, especially SEIU 503, they have a voice. And again, that's what the union difference is. And when it comes to the vaccine mandate, uh, there is no big consensus amongst our membership. Uh, we have folks who feel strongly in support of the mandate. Um, and that's a, a majority of our members. And we also have people who strongly oppose the mandate and we hear both sides. But I think we can all agree that having a say in how this new policy impacts our lives is a good thing and very, very important. The next couple of weeks are going to be really challenging as we hit deadlines for state workers to get vaccines and other employers will be rolling out new mandates. And I'm thankful that we don't have to go it alone. Thanks, Mike. That's a really important point. Um, I also want to say, uh, as we wrap up this topic, that our union does encourage everyone get the vaccine. Uh, in Oregon, there are more than two and a half million people who have been safely vaccinated against COVID-19. Vaccines are free and effective at reducing the spread of COVID-19, including the Delta variant. And the vaccine will also reduce your chance of becoming seriously ill or being hospitalized and dying if you were to get COVID-19. The bottom line is the vaccines are our best weapon against fighting to reopen, or sorry, our best weapon against COVID and our best chance of reopening Oregon. So you can find more information and resources about the vaccines on our website. I encourage everyone to head over to seiu503.org forward slash COVID-19 where we've posted information and resources that are specifically relevant to SEIU 503 members. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Mike. Okay, now I'd like to switch gears again and bring in Melissa Unger, Executive Director of our union. Melissa, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Ben, happy to be here. Great, so this week, university employees at Oregon's seven public universities, universities uh, kicked off their contract bargaining campaign. Can you let us know what uh, union members in higher ed are focused on this year? 
Yeah, you know, higher ed members have faced quite the um, uphill battle through the pandemic, like everyone has. Um, they saw um, some layoffs, work, work share with reduced hours, um, and also um, just being on campus, trying to keep it going while many people on campus got to work from home. And I think, um, and, you know, just a lot of unknowns as colleges um, went to remote learning. And so, you know, what the big issues are, um, you know, are wages, um, making sure that they um, um, keep up with the cost of living and also making sure that people who worked in person during this pandemic get recognition for that, either through hazard pay or pandemic recognition pay. Um, then benefits, making sure we maintain um, health care and retirement benefits. Safety, as students come back to campus, how are they going to stay safe? Um, and then for people who've been able to work from home, why change that um, if they've been able to successfully do their jobs from home? So making sure that they're doing um, telecommuting and then respect. We've often found on these um, on campuses that um, our members feel disrespected by administration, um, that even though um, our workers um, make the campuses run, they do not get the credit for the important work they do. And um, some of our um, food service workers are some of the lowest paid public employees in the entire state. So really lifting up those salaries is a key element to bargaining this year. Thanks, Melissa. And so how are we feeling? Do we feel optimistic about winning on these things? You know, I think um, I, I, we have a long history of having to fight hard in higher education for everything that we get and our members have taken on those fights. But we do know that the universities um, got their full budget ask this year for the first time in a long time with record breaking state revenues. Um, we also know that, um, you know, enrollment um, is coming in and that students are coming back to campuses and that some of the campuses have a record breaking fundraising. So um, we are hopeful um, that the universities have budgeted to make sure that they have frontline staff um, who are um, have competitive salaries. And we're, we're not taking that hope as the way that we're gonna win this. Um, our members already are showing up for unity breaks, showing up to support the contract. They have a bargaining team who's ready to bargain um, and make sure that we're doing everything we can to win this contract by member action throughout these seven universities because we know these universities would not run without our members. Hey, thank you so much, Melissa. Make sure everyone to follow along uh, at SEIU503.org, on our Facebook page, on Twitter and Instagram uh, to get the latest updates uh, for the higher ed bargaining campaign. And we have breaking news on vaccine mandates for the home care contract ratification that's coming up right around the corner and for all of the important work that the Latinx caucus and other caucuses are doing all year long. So thank you so much, Melissa. Mike, Rebecca, and Yvonne for joining us today. Thank you everyone for tuning in and we will see you next month on our uh, monthly Facebook update. Thanks. Thanks, Ben.